Um, with that, I'd like to welcome your moderator, Drew Taylor. He is one of the uh, hosts, he, the host of the Fine Tuning Podcast and a freelance journalist that's been covering film and animation for the past decade. And he currently writes for The Wrap. Drew? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for putting down Zelda for a couple of hours for us here. Uh, let's, let's bring Craig out here. Craig McCracken, legendary cartoonist, animator, designer. So yeah, I wanted to start at the beginning and sort of where your interest in, in comic books and, and animation came from. Well, I was, I'm the youngest of three, right? So I have a, nine, a brother who's nine years older than me and a sister who's 11 years older than me and everybody in my family are artists. They're all creative. So when I was growing up, you know, my sister would be doing silk screen and my brother would be making puppet shows and my mom would be sewing and my dad was an architect and engineer. And so like the family was just making stuff. And so as the little one, I was like, I, I want to do that too. And so I just started drawing probably at about three years old and just kept doing it, kept doing it and became kind of obsessed with it. And then just always drew and then was really in love with cartoon characters, and then I remember one night when I was 12 years old, I just went, I'm going to be a cartoonist when I grow up. And then from that point on, I was trying to create my characters that would be my characters from that early age. Was it, were your parents like taking you seriously? Or was oh, absolutely, oh, no. Okay. My mom was incredibly supportive because she was an artist and she was an art teacher, so she was like, yes, please do this, this is great. Now, did you, you initially wanted to, to sort of focus on comic book? Art. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. What it really was is I wanted to create characters and tell stories and tell jokes and draw pictures, right? And so growing up in the, you know, mid '70s, early '80s, there wasn't a show creator in animation. That wasn't really a job that existed. So I was more drawn towards like um, comic strip artists, like Bill Watterson or Charles Schultz or, you know, Hergé who did Tintin, or Bob Burton who did Flaming Carrots. So I, I love the idea of like, I just want to tell stories and create characters. That's what I kind of want to do. Uh, and then you went to CalArts. So I want to yeah. know, how, how did you sort of, obviously it has this kind of ethical standing right. now, um, right. having been established by Walt Disney and all these right. amazing people. But yeah, how did you sort of get interested in it and what was that experience like attending? Well, what happened is I realized when I was in high school that a lot of my ideas were, that I was coming up with, like I had ideas for characters' voices or I had like a gag for how somebody moved or I had an idea for mu like music that I wanted to be put into it. So I thought, well, maybe I should study animation. So, but I was kind of worried about it at first because I was like, I don't want to learn how to animate deers running in perspective. It's like, I, I wanted to make cartoons. So I, you know, got into CalArts, and when I got there, I realized there was sort of this broader industry that I wasn't aware of, where it was like, oh, you can have an entire career as a character designer, you can have a whole career as a storyboard artist. It's not just flipping the pages and, and animating movement. Right. Well, I mean, it was also a crucial time for you because you met all of these people who you collaborated with right. for years and years. Gindy was there, Paul Riddish was there, yeah. Mike Moon was there. Yeah. Um, what was it like connecting with those people? Like, how did you say, oh my God, these are like my dudes? Right, well, because when, you know, uh, this was pre-internet, so I didn't have like an online community of other artists. I was like one of two guys in my high school who could draw, and the only one who liked cartoons. So when you get into Cal Arts, you finally have met your people. So there's like, we've been speaking the same language, but we didn't know each other. So, you know, when, we, when I got there, there were sort of two factions in my class. There were the group of guys who really wanted to work for Disney and be Disney animators. Then there was a smaller group of us who loved cartoons, who loved, you know, Looney Tunes and Jay Ward and Hanna-Barbera and UPA. And that was, you know, Gendy and Rob Renzetti and Conrad Vernon and, uh, 
the Apal Rurish, you know, it was that group of people. So we just sort of all congregated to each other because we had this similar interest, you know. And then uh, you did a short called Whoop Ass Stew. Yeah. Okay, where did this come from? Um, it came from, so my freshman year I had done these films called No Neck Joe for Spike Mike's Festival, for school and for Spike Mike's Festival of Animation. So was th over the summer I was going, well, what do I want to do for my sophomore film? And I knew I wanted to do sort of a parody of a superhero thing because I was a big fan of um, these shorts that used to be on MTV called Stevie Washington, The Angry Youth by Joe Horn. So I wanted to do something like that, but I didn't know who my hero character was or whatever, right? I didn't want to do the standard hero first guy or whatever. So my mom said, hey, your brother's birthday's coming up. Why don't you draw something for him, right? So I'm like, all right, what am I gonna draw? At the time, I, I was, well, still am, but like uh, Paul Rudish had this amazing ability to draw things that were both cool and edgy and super cute. It was like, he had this like hybrid style of like Jamie Hewlett and Richard Scarry. And I said, <laughs> I'm gonna try, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to draw something like, and he would do a lot of rave flyers because it was the early 90s. So I said, I'm gonna try to do like, I'll draw like a rave flyer like Paul would draw. And I happened to draw these three little girls and then I stopped and went, oh, wait a minute. What if they were the superheroes? So then it just started snowballing from there and I ended up drawing that thing <laughs> for my brother. Like the first drawing was like this big and I went, oh, I like that. So then I modified it and made that and gave that to my brother for his birthday. But then that just started the idea and I was like, okay, this is gonna be my second year student film and I'm gonna kind of devote all my time to this. Did you ever think it would come back? <laughs> that? Yes. Yeah, no, I, yes. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he gave it back. Okay. Um, that's funny about Paul. Too bad, yeah. he, too bad he never made a career. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so your first sort of like professional experience is on Two Stupid Dogs with right. Andy. And uh, what was that experience like? What did you learn from uh, doing that show? Well, what, you know, I, the way I got that job is Paul, again, called me up and said, hey, we're looking for an art director on the show at Hanna-Barbera, it's called Two Stupid Dogs, bring your book down. So I brought my portfolio down. I met Don and Cook. I got hired on the spot to art direct. I didn't know what an art director did. I never worked a day in the industry. And then he said, do you know any storyboard artists? And I said, oh yeah, my friends Rob and Gendy are great. You should hire them. So then Rob and Gendy came in. Um, and it was funny, Paul thought Rob and Gendy were one person named Robin <laughs> Gendy. And then he met them and went, oh, you're two people. So we started working on Two Stupid Dogs and it was, Fred Seibert had kind of started this era where, hey, why don't you let cartoonists make cartoons? Why don't you give them a chance? Uh, but I don't know if Hanna-Barbera as a bigger studio was knew where to put us. So they literally put us in a trailer in the parking lot at Hanna-Barbera. So there were six of us in that trailer. But the thing that was great about it is, you know, CalArts teaches you the craft of animation and the art of animation, the history and how to think creatively. But Hanna-Barbera is a factory, right? And they taught you like, here is how you actually make this stuff. It's a trade, you're on a schedule, you've got a budget. And like, we just learned so much just from just the mechanics of a studio that had been around that long, of just how to actually get it done and kind of put the art side of it away and like actually make these things. Well, everyone in this room looks like they're about 18 years old, but the, <laughs> earth, the 90s was a very exciting time yeah. for animation. And yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about that time specifically and sort of how it compares well, I think it was the first, you know, it was this, there was a thing a few years before called the Toon Boom, and like Roger Rabbit had come out, and The Simpsons had come out, and there was this, it was kind of building towards, hey, animation is this viable thing, and through shows like Ren and Stimpy, this idea of, hey, why don't you give shows to the artists, right? And so that was what the philosophy was, was just let the creative people be in charge, and let them make shows and see what they do. You know, why not, you yeah. know? And so that's really the kind of the, the, the beginning stages of, of that era. And I, that's when I started to think like, oh, maybe I actually could make my own show. Right. Right, and so at the time, we were working on Two Stupid Dogs. I had my student film for Whoop Ass Girls. 
I took it up to the development department in Hanna-Barbera. This is 93. I showed it to Margo McDonough. She said, I'm not supposed to do this, but she bypassed the entire development department, took me down to Fred Seibert's office. We played it for Fred Seibert, and Fred Seibert said, yeah, let's make it. Let's do 13 episodes. Let's do, let's do 13 episodes. So I walked back to the trailer going, I just sold the whoop-ass girls, right? <laughs> and then as we were doing contract negotiations, um, Fred called me back and said, no, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this shorts program right. with Cartoon Network. And that became What a Cartoon, yes. where we started doing those shorts. So that was 95? Yeah, 94, 95, okay. around that time, yeah. And so I was going to ask you if it was always an idea to do it as a series before that. Yeah, in my, you know, back fantasies in the back of my mind, but there was no path to that, you know. Well, but now it looked like maybe there was. Well, was the What a Cartoon show a kind of incubator? Because you had a you had a short, Gendy had a short, Dave yeah. Weiss, Rob had a short. Yeah. Um, so it se was that kind of like the testing ground? Yeah, pretty, pretty much. It was like, let's give these artists that are here at the studio a chance. And like, so... Gendy pitched Dexter's the same day I pitched Powerpuff. We both got the green lights on the same day. And so the same, essentially three people made all four of those shorts. So myself and Paul and Gendy made the, I can't even remember the order we did them in. We made Yours was the first show was that it? aired. Thanks. And, and then Dexter's was the right. second, yeah. But so we probably did Powerpuff first and then Gendy and I switched hats and we made Dexter's and then we switched hats back and I did another Powerpuff and Gendy did another Dexter's. Yeah. But it was the same three of us really who were doing those shorts together. Was there some kind of like, did they get a big response? Like, how, I mean, how did it go from you doing this for this weird anthology to being brought on for an entire show? Well, what ended up happening is so the, the shorts were made, the Dexter shorts were made, the Powerpuff shorts were made. Then they go to focus testing where you show them to kids. And I was in a focus test for Meet Fuzzy Lumpkins. They invited me to it. And there's a, you've probably heard this. There's a group of 11 year old boys who watched it and literally said, this is the worst cartoon they ever made. And whoever made it should be fired. So I went, all right, that's it. My career's over with. And then I, tr for like a week, I redesigned the girls. I gave them fingers. I made them look like more real people. And I literally got a call from Mike Lazo. And he said, look, I heard what you're doing. I heard you're trying to change the girls. Don't. And he goes, you got a really extreme negative reaction. And he goes, I'm more interested in extreme reactions than lukewarm reactions. He said the fact that they hated it meant there was something there that was hurting them. <laughs> and you just have to figure out the formula to get them to love it. Because the thing that, the thing that Lazo said scared him was when people were like, yeah, that was okay. Right. That's what he didn't want. But get, Dexter's kind of performed more positively over you know, the focus testing, so they picked up Dexter's first, okay. which was actually the best thing that could have ever happened. Because that's where we really kind of cut our teeth and learned how to make shows, make cartoons. It also seemed to be a time when that kind of UPA style was very in vogue. I don't know what it was, but the, you know, the, in the 90s, there was like a lot of kind of throwbacks to the 50s and early right. 60s and that aesthetic. And right. do you think that gave you kind of a, a leg up? A little bit, but it was also just like we realized that designing a show that way was a little more production friendly. Like we were noticing that people were trying to pull off Warner Brothers style animation on a television schedule and budget with an overseas studio. And what you were getting back wasn't great. Right. So we were like, but if we design it to be a little more user friendly and easier to draw for studios, I mean, Genny and I, Genny had a term instead of limited animation, he called it controlled animation, where it was only move what's necessary and the stuff we can control, like the layouts and the designs, that stuff we know we can make that stuff good. So let's not rely on the most beautiful animation because we knew we just weren't going to get it based yeah. on the, the overseas studio system. And these were cell, this was actual this was cell cells. animation. Yeah, cells. We'll tell you guys what cells are. <laughs> there's, there's two of them yeah. over there. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to talk about a weird uh, part of your career. In 1995, you did the character designs for the Dumb and Dumber I did. animated series. <laughs> I did. Now, the, that was such a short-lived, like, non-thing, almost. Yeah. We, when we got picked up for Dexter's, they only picked up six half hours first. And they wanted to see how they did and see what they thought of them. So there was this weird interim period where we were, I was at Hanna-Barbera, and we were just waiting for the back seven pickup and they said hey we're doing this dumb and dumber show uh 
And they handed it out to a bunch of artists. Kelman did stuff. I think Andy Bial did some things. Paul Rouge did the, I did some. And I literally just did like a three quarter drawing of the main characters and then turned them into whoever asked me to do it. And then they said, oh, they're gonna use your designs. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. And I never worked on the show. I wasn't involved in it. I wasn't, that was just, just a long lunch hour. Yeah, yeah pretty yeah. much. I'm like, yeah, there's, that's how I would draw them. I, maybe I did a turnaround for them, but I was never like, on oh, Dumb and Dumb. Okay. I, don't even know I have several questions it. about, did they have to sign off on it? But you Maybe never they did. did. Yeah. Maybe yeah. secretly Jim Carrey, you know. And Jeff Daniels his, were, yeah. They were, I yeah. have no idea. Yeah. 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 Um, during this period, did you, do you feel like you were refining your aesthetic? What would what we would characterize as sort of a Craig McCracken look? Yeah, well, not just a look, but just how to make cartoons. Like, wh when I was on Dexter's Laboratory, I art directed that show, but I also was doing a lot of the storyboards. And so I really learned how to tell stories in a short format. Because a lot of times, like Meet Fuzzy Lumpkins and even Crime 101, they're really artsy and weird. And like, I wasn't communicating with kids and I was just being a goof. And so when I was on Dexter's, because it wasn't my show, I was like, okay, I'm making this for Gendy and this is what he wants and I'm gonna try to do this and I'm gonna try to communicate to the kids. I really learned how to make short cartoons and just did lots and lots of boards and treated things a little more sincerely and just was trying to you know do fun stuff and that's why i ended up getting powerpuff i never re-pitched powerpuff to cartoon network like linda Siminski and mike lazo came into my office one day when we were wrapping up season four of dexters and they said so we're going to do powerpuff now and i'm like what <laughs> they're like yeah we want to keep the crew together we have been loving your boards you just consistently deliver these funny, really well done boards on Dexter's and we think you're ready for your own show. Wow. And so I went, okay, I'll do it. And I took it, you know, deadly serious. And they're like, we want you to write a Bible. And, and I remember there's a period where Laza was like, can you just call them pink, blue, and green? Because I can't tell them apart. <laughs> and I went, no, I'm not calling them pink, blue, and green. And so I was like, I need to, because this is now a second chance. Yeah. You know? And so I'm like, all right, I'm going to just be sincere about this. I'm going to treat them like kids. I'm going to put an origin in every episode. But when I put this Bible together, I was finding myself just trying to describe the characters over and over again. And I just went, you know what? I need to get their voices on the page. So I just wrote 20 questions and I had the three girls answer them in the Bible. And so when they got it, they went, oh, I know who they are and I know how they respond to things. And so that was just like just being sincere and writing the characters sincerely and, and not being so kind of artsy and, and weird. Well, can we talk about your, your creative uh, partnership with, with Gendy? Another guy yeah. who, sadly, his yeah. career never took off. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gendy and I, I mean, we're, we both are, I mean, obviously we like the same kind of cartoons. Yes. We both love visual storytelling. Um, we b both love high design. Uh, but one thing we really did when we were on Dexter's Laboratory was we realized we only had seven minutes and dialogue eats up time what, terribly. So we we're like, how do we tell these bigger stories in this shorter time? So we both like were just studying filmmakers like the Coen brothers. Like we went and saw Hudsucker Proxy and if you haven't seen it, it's the most cartoony movie ever made. And sequences like the blue letter sequence and the hula hoop sequence and even, even uh, Sam Raimi's Army of Darkness you know, yeah. those had sequences in it with no dialogue, but it was a way of caricaturing and cartooning things that weren't just about cartooning, drawing a funny drawing. It was like, oh, the music can be cartooned. The, the art direction can be cartooned or caricatured. And so we just got obsessed with those films and went, that's how we get more story in less time. So Gendy and I just kind of fell in love with that kind of language and just, we were like, really good collaborators for the, the period we were working on. Yeah, on Sam Raimi directed the Hula Hoop. Yeah, sequence. I know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's the best sequence. Yeah. But it was just like, here's how to get a lot of information in with just pictures. So you get Powerpuff Girls, it's a show. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and you're, you say, oh shit, this yeah. is all on me. Right. Uh, what, was, what were those sort of initial you know, few months or years like? It was exciting because, you know, we all loved working with each other on that Dexter's crew. And so we were so happy that we didn't have to disband and we got to keep making stuff, you know? And, you know, we, on Dexter's we were doing seven minutes, but on Powerpuff they let us do 11. So we're like, okay, now we're getting a chance to 
kind of expand and learn everything uh, that we learned on Dexter's. And Dex and Gendy is just a huge action fan, right? And so he, uh, you know, I think he saw power clips like, now I can show what I can do with action. You know, because there was even a period when we were doing Dexter's, you know, we had that sidebar on the end of the Dexter's credits and they just showed clips of the main title. Gendy literally wanted to do a scene with Gen Dexter riding a black horse with a flaming sword <laughs> and like, he, you know, because he wanted to do Samurai Jack, but he was like, yeah, I'm gonna have Dexter on the sword. And we were like, what does this have to do with the horse? <laughs> this has nothing to do with the show we're making. But he, he, even then he wanted to, you know, do that. Like, and so I think he saw Powerpuff as a chance to like, now we can do action. Right. You know? When did you know that you had a genuine sort of phenomenon on your hands? Well, there was a few things. Pinatas definitely <laughs> were a, a telltale sign. Down. Yeah, no. when you get pinatas, you know that you've maybe made some cultural impact. Yeah. <laughs> we had an airplane once, a Delta commuter flight, oh. in, in, that flew like the East Coast with the Powerpuff Girls on it. But the, the one that kind of hit me the most is my mom had a friend who was visiting the Amazon rainforest and brought her back like a little hand-woven artisan basket with blossom on it. Oh, and I'm like, wow. how is this reach the Amazon rainforest? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, yeah, this is a thing. And I thought Powerpuff was gonna be like a cult kid. I thought like, oh, okay, no, I thought it would be get some shirts in a record store somewhere and maybe years <laughs> later they go, remember that weird show that was on Cartoon Network about those superhero girls? Like I didn't imagine it would be what it became. Did, did its oversized success impact you at all or interfere with the ongoing production of the show? It only interfered with the ongoing production because I wanted to have my hand in everything. So like every like chapter book that might cross my desk, I'd like, I gotta redraw this or every like, you know, pose in a style guide or any the comic books or whatever. And I was just like getting, trying to do the show and trying to do all those things and, and, and there was one time I was on, we were like behind production. There was one time I was on the phone with Lazo and I was complaining about some of the consumer products or something. And he just went, Craig, I need you to finish that fucking show. And, and I'm like, okay. And I wrote it on a post-it and I shoved it in front of my desk. And then I just kind of went, I can't look at all the books. Yeah. I can't look, cause it was too much. That would have been a full-time job. And I just said, I've got to just disconnect from that and then get, just focus on the show the whole time. Well, speaking of that, you left the show in 2002. Was that to work on the movie? Why, no, why did um, you? well, we, we put the show on pause to do the movie. Okay. Then after we did the movie, Powerpuff picked back up, but as soon as we finished the movie, Linda and Lazo took me out to dinner and they said, we want another show from you. Okay. So I started developing what became Foster's, and when I had to go do Foster's, I couldn't also do Powerpuff full time okay. for the last two seasons, yeah. All right, let's talk about the movie, which I love. Oh, thank I you. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I think we need another track and track and movie. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, um, so released in 2002, it was like sort of a big summer tentpole movie. Yeah. Can you talk about what that experience was like? Well, making the movie was intense, and I, th I think they were sort of treating it more like it was just a long episode, but the w we making it didn't think it was a long episode, so it was just really hard to make, and we were working like crazy. I, I remember heating up Thanksgiving dinner in a microwave at Cartoon Network Studios because I couldn't have Thanksgiving with Lauren, and it was just, we were just working so hard on it, but it was also a weird period where I think Lazo was starting to like, get the notions of Adult Swim. Oh, interesting. Right, like, oh, you can make an animation for an older audience. So, picked up Samurai Jack, and then the Powerpuff movie happened at the same time, and he was sort of encouraging us to make it like a really kick-ass action movie. Yeah. You know? And so we did that. And then it got delivered to Cartoon Network, and I got it, and, and Lazo did love it. He really loved it. He watched the animatic over and over again and go, this is great, this is, I love it, the more times I see this, I think it's fantastic. In the time it took to make the movie, there was a big regime change at Cartoon Network, and the new bosses saw it, and I don't know what got said, but I got a call that said, Craig, you killed the heart and soul of Powerpuff Girls. And I'm like, oh my god, what? And then we, you know, we tried to do what we could to repair it, but it, 
you know, it got released. And it, one of the, what was the issue? It was dark. It was <laughs> heavy. It wasn't pink. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't hearts and stars and girly. It was, you know, and part of it was my own fault because I started seeing the consumer products being like the buttercup jewelry kit. And I'm like, this isn't what we're making. Right. So I was like, I'm going to reclaim the whoop ass girls and make this really big action movie. But, you know, so that was an issue. But I think one of the bigger issues with it was Warner Brothers was distributing it. And Warner Brothers told Cartoon Network, like, you're going to get killed on January 3rd because Like Mike is coming out and Men in Black 2 is coming out. No one's going to come see this movie. Right. And they said, we, we, we recommend you move the release date. And for whatever reason, they didn't move it and we got killed. The other thing I found out is boys were actually afraid to go to the movie theater and see it. They didn't want to buy a ticket because they didn't want to be seen going to a girls movie. And I had actually heard this story from Linda during the height of Powerpuff as Girls as a show they did a focus group just to check on Powerpuff how it was, and they asked the boys, like, who watches Powerpuff Girls? One boy raised their hand. Then they said, put your heads down and close your eyes. Who watches Powerpuff Girls? They all raised their hand. <laughs> so there was this, like, there was this fear, right, that they didn't, they didn't want to go see, you know, be seen buying the ticket. Maybe they bought a Men in Black 2 ticket. Yes, they did, and that snuck in. I hope so. But that didn't help us no, at the box no, office. No. So what, what, are your, what are your ultimate thoughts about the movie? I mean, I uh, did not pick up on the fact that it was kind of a in-between version of whatever you wanted. Right. How do you feel? I, 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 I think it's beautiful. I think we did the best job we could do. I, at the time, I, I've learned so much about story structure. And I've also learned about how you know, an 11 minute is not a 90 minute. Like, it's it's a different animal, right? And I was just like, let's just make it like a long episode. And it's like, I wish in hindsight, like I would approach a Powerpuff movie totally different now than I did then. Now I'm really proud of it and we worked really hard on it. And I think it looks incredible, but uh, yeah, it's, but, you know, it, it is what it is. We did new the best. Powerpuff Girls new movie, that's an interesting thought. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, they've tried it. You know, there was a 2016 yeah. reboot that actually made it on air. There was a live action thing that was tried and yeah. it didn't get picked up serious. What What is the secret sauce, the chemical X, if you will, that um, these other versions are missing? Uh, I'm not going to say it, but you know, it, 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 it's also sincerity, right? When we were making Powerpuff, we were trying to make the best cartoon we could, and it was coming from this place of this group of creative people who loved working together and loved making this show and were passionate about it. And then the products were uh, like secondary. The yeah. merchandise was secondary. The reboot happened because consumer products and marketing said, we want to turn on that Powerpuff money-making machine again. Go find some animation producers and make the show again. Right. And so, is, and you know, I don't want to disparage those, that crew who did the reboot because it's good people and there's talented people and they, they met well, but it wasn't coming from their hearts. It was a job. They were hired to do that marketing people asked them to do. And I also think there were some probably rules. They were like, well, they can't be as violent and you can't show this and you can't show this. Um, and when I look at, I didn't really watch it, I can't, but like what I gleaned from it was we made a show about superheroes who happened to be kids. And it seemed like, the, and the girls was almost secondary. Because we never, we, we, the show was made largely by a group of guys. Yeah. So we never went like, well, what did girls, these mysterious girls like, right? <laughs> we just went, what did, what, what were kid things that you dealt with as a kid and how would you apply superpowers to that? Whereas the reboot felt like they made a show about girls that happened to have superpowers. Yeah. And it was like a different perspective and approach. And I think maybe that's why it just didn't connect. Yeah. Because you can reboot something incredibly well. Lauren has proven that out with, with Pony. You know, she's probably made the best animated version of My, of my Little Pony there has ever been. Um, and also our friends Frank Angomis, his reboot of DuckTales is great. Yep. But they loved those projects. Yeah. And they put that they remember why they loved those projects when they were kids and they put that into the, the work. Yeah. You know? 
did you see anything from the live action? Did you, what do you, what are, you, are you opposed to a live action? Well, I had one meeting with Diablo and Greg and Warner Brothers before the pandemic, like February 2020. And I met with them and they're like, we're gonna do this live action Powerpuff version with them as adults, what do you think? And I went, well, you've made them adults. They're no longer the Powerpuff Girls. Right. Because the Powerpuff Girls, their kryptonite is the fact that they have to go to bed on time. Their oh, kryptonite right. is they have to listen to their dad. They have to go to school. Their kryptonite is the fact that they're children, yeah. right? And when you take that aspect out of it, it's just three Supergirls. Yeah. Right. It's not Powerpuff anymore. Yeah. You know, so I don't know what's happening with it, you know. There were some leaked set photos. I, was, I mean, the yeah, girls look great those. in their little outfits, but yeah, I don't know. It, right. it didn't get past the pilot stage. I yeah, I don't know what it was. When I asked them, like, well, how are you doing Mojo and Fuzzy and the Amoeba Boys? And they're like, oh, we can't. And I'm like, well, then why do it? <laughs> like, if Mojo's not a monkey, what is this thing? Like, you know? Maybe they'll figure it out. Okay, um, can you talk about the, the origins of Fosters? It's a beautiful story. Yes. There's a bigger story. Oh, let's tell it here. Um, originally, Fosters started out as a show called By George about, and it's, it's going to be a weird roundabout thing. So it's a show called By George about this young couple you know, in their late 20s, 30s, who had a baby. And their baby, George, had the ability to manifest any emotion or feeling or thought he had into an imaginary friend. Okay. Right? So they're in this apartment, and oh no, George is both cranky and tired. So tired shows up, and cranky shows up. Oh, now hungry's here. And like, so the parents had to deal with not only these manifestations of these emotions, but they had to take care of their toddler, their infant son. Right? I had developed the characters, I figured out what their apartment looked like, I had designed them, I had created all of George's emotions. I ran into Linda Semensky at Hanna-Barbera, at Cartoon Network Studios, rather, and I said, oh, come here, I have this new idea for a show. And she said, oh, I'm really excited. And I pitched it to her, and she went, huh. <laughs> and, I'm, and she's like, I've never heard anything like that. And I went, oh, no, she doesn't like it. So I went home, and I started panicking. Lauren, I'm like, bitch, that didn't feel the same thing. She doesn't like it. What, whatever, you know, it's not right. And, I'm, and I said, well, what do I love about this idea? And the thing, the essence of it, what I loved was regular people hanging out with imaginary friends, like just these strange creatures in our world. And I was like, that's what I want more than anything. And I was like, well, how else do I make that happen? And at the time, Lauren and I had two shelter dogs that we'd adopted, and we had always wondered, like, what was their life like before they came to us? So I went, why don't I just think about them like a dog shelter, but a foster home for imaginary friends, right? So, like, where did these friends come from? Who created them? Uh, what was their history like? Why were they created that way? So the next day, and, and like, I just started writing it all down in the notebook that one night. I, in the car, driving to work, Lauren was driving, I'm like writing down more stuff. I ran into Linda the next day, and I'm like, wait, do you have a few minutes? And I said, remember that thing I pitched you yesterday about the baby and the imaginary friends? And she's like, yeah, and I said, I changed it. I said, it's now about a foster home for imaginary friends. And she laughed, and she <laughs> smiled, and I went, that's it, that's the show. Yeah. And so, and like, as we were talking about it, she was like, oh, that's really exciting. She goes, is there a kid in it? And like on the spot, I lied and said, yeah, there's a kid who doesn't want to give up his imaginary friend, but they've agreed to let his friend live there as long as he comes and visits every day. And she went, oh, great. And so like, I just, and so I knew that was the show, right? But I, it was this, it's this kind of good exercise in that how malleable ideas are and to really kind of find the essence of why you like something because it can always evolve and change. You know, and Foster's even continued to evolve after it was greenlit. You know, when, when we were in the store meetings first making the show, Frankie was married. She was like in her 30s, she was married, she had a husband, he had a husband named Brian, and we would be breaking stories, and I would go, oh, what's Brian doing? And we, were, and he, we found that both Wilt and Mac were doing exactly what Brian was doing. So in the store meeting, we were like, okay, Frankie's now 20, she's not married, um, that makes Frankie a little more youthful and she can uh, fit in with her friends and Mac can have a crush on her. And like, I remember Craig Lewis said, Coco should lay eggs. And I went, Coco's a girl now. <laughs> so it's like, you just, you, 
it, maybe Lauren may have been the one who insisted that Coco was a girl, to be honest. But it, 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 those, you just have to be open to that kind of like, like sculpting with your team to find those ideas. Anytime Brian's off screen, everyone should be asking. Yeah, Where's Brian? Well, he, had, he had nothing to do. Uh, have you guys kept uh, adopting dogs? We have. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. What was it like? Because Lauren was, was incredibly instrumental in the development of the show and, yeah. and continuing on the show. Okay. Can I ask, like, what it what is it like partnering with your life partner? It's e well, it's easy because I mean we started this creative conversation 22 years, 23 years ago, and we haven't stopped. Like, you know, uh, she uh, she had a friend on Powerpuff, one of our directors named Randy Myers. Lauren was an animator, 2D animator at uh, Turner. We had animated on Cats Don't Dance and Iron Giant. And when 2D animation started to fall apart, um, she was looking for work. And so she, went, she was a fan of Powerpuff. She went to Randy and said, hey, can I take a storyboard test? So she was taking this storyboard test, and I didn't know what was happening. She was taking this board test. Then she finishes the test, Randy brings it in, introduces me to her. I'm like, wow, who are you? <laughs> and and, um, and you know, she told me, she's like, oh, I've been seeing your name my whole life because my half-brother's named Greg McCracken. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's weird. <laughs> so um, I read her storyboard, and I'm like, this is great. And then I take it to Gendy, and I'm like, take a look at this, this is a friend of Randy's. And he's like, what do you think? And I'm like, just read it. And he read it, and he came out and goes, we should hire her. And I went, that's what I thought. So like, <laughs> we hired her, and just from the time she started working, we just clicked. Like, you know, we have, you, you won't believe the amount of things we have in common. So it's just, it's just been this kind of, you know, just the love of my life and th this you know, creative collaboration we've had together. And like, we have this joke that like, when you hire one of us, you get the other one for free. <laughs> <laughs> so like every project Lauren is on, I'm not working on it, but she's showing me everything and everything I'm doing, I'm showing her and it's just, we just really kind of uh, understand each other and like my weaknesses are her strengths and you know, we just kind of really help each other. Can we pause to give a big awe? Yes, please. Uh, so in 2022, they announced the Foster's spinoff, mm -hmm. reboot, something that you are actually working on, right? Oh, it was yeah. my idea. Okay, so yes. what, what, why, I guess, why now? Like, what is the, what's the elevator pitch? Um, it basically what it was is, you know, Lauren and I have a, a young daughter who's seven now, and when she was really little, we both were watching a lot of preschool shows. And as a parent, there's a lot of bad preschool shows. <laughs> but you, there's also, like, when you find a really good one that you, your whole family just embraces and loves, um, you're just like, oh my god, please, thank you, thank you. Like when my daughter's like, let's watch Bluey. I'm like, yes, let's watch Bluey. Right? So there's this market for really great preschool. And when my daughter was really little, she would want to watch Fosters when she was like three and she would call it Monsters. And she would watch, we put it on, but it wasn't written for her. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? The thing I love about Fosters is it's not just about Mac, Blue, Will, Eduardo, and Coco, right? It's about this home for imaginary friends. And there's no reason why I can't turn the camera to another group of friends who are maybe more targeted towards like you know, younger viewers mm -hmm. and explore their story in the house. And so that's basically you know, what the, the pitch was, is like, why don't we make a version of Fosters, a spin-off within the house for um, little kids. And my original, and you know, some of the original friends are gonna be in it. My original title for it was Blue's Clueless, but <laughs> we didn't go with that. But part of it came from one of the other things that happened with our daughter is she loves it when we screw up, right? She loves it when we make mistakes. So we're like, could you do a show about teaching kids how to do things correctly by showing an older character screw up? And we're like, well, Blue is perfect for that, right? <laughs> He's an idiot. So like watching him mess up and the other ones go, well, that's not how to solve problems. We thought it could be a fun, so we're currently developing that and hoping to go, you know, pitch that out to. I'm a little sad he's still in the Foster house. 
know, he shouldn't. He, he, well, he, 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 he doesn't age. He's still in the well, system. Well, like the, the, what's great about the show is it literally is like it's happening currently with right after you know. Uh, Goodbye to Blue. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. It's like, it's still the same time. It's okay. just another room in the house. It's not the future. I love that. There's also a John Krasinski movie coming out next year that you might want to share. There's sure some things about, 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 about that. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also <laughs> served as like a creative consultant on a bunch of shows, including Chowder, Uncle Grandpa, and regular shows. So I wanted to know sort of what, what did you, how did you advise, or what was your capacity in those shows? And yeah, well, I wasn't really a consultant on a chowder other than yelling at the development department that you better pick this up because it's incredible. <laughs> um, but, but Uncle Grandpa and Regular Show and to a certain extent Adventure Time sort of came from the Cartoon Institute, okay. which was sort of, you know, Sue Snyder came to me at one point and said, I want you to start a development program. You know, and I'm like, well, you already have a development department. And he said, well, a little creative competition in the studio is a good thing. So Rob Renzetti and I set up the Cartoon Institute exactly like what a cartoon. So it was like, artists would come to us, they'd pitch us their idea, we said, that sounds great, go to a storyboard. The other thing we did, we paid them for it because if they had a day job, they weren't gonna spend time on their, their own work. If they got paid for it, they'd do it. So they, they would do their seven minute board, they'd come in, they'd pitch it to us, and then, like, the brain trust of the Cartoon Institute and Rob Sorcher, who's the one executive in the room, we would, the artist would leave, and that moment, we'd go, are we making it or are we not making it? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. And if it was a yes, then we would make their short. If it was a no, then we'd say, thank you for doing it, it's not right for us right now, but you get paid for it or whatever. So, you know, JG and uh, Pete Brongard, they were part of that program, so they were the guys who just got the yes, and we were just sort of there to kind of offer our experience because it's like, you guys have the talent, you're no different than Gendy and I were, you know, we just want to give you the opportunity to make your thing. Um, and so we tried, Rob and I tried to like just kind of stay out of their way and let them do their thing, and Penn didn't necessarily pitch Adventure Time in the Cartoon Institute, but when Nickelodeon passed on it, like we shoved it in Rob Sorcher's face and said, "This is the next greatest cartoon. You better pick this up." Really? Because like we, we like we said we could bring Penn into the Cartoon Institute and we could do a short with Penn, but why when this is here and ready to go? Yeah. Like just do it now. But you know there were just certain things, um, advice we could give. Like I remember when JG was first developing Regular Show, he had Mordecai and Rigby working at a human zoo. <laughs> <laughs> right? Where there were literally humans in cages and they were like sweeping out the cages and I'm like, that's really funny, but you're going to hate that you decided that in uh, by season three. Right. Because you may want to put a human in your show and that just makes it weird. <laughs> like, and I'm like, just don't, don't, it doesn't matter where they work or what they do. Right. And I'm just like, I'm giving you this advice is like, you're going to, it's a funny concept now, but it's going to drive you crazy later. So get rid of that stuff. But. A lot of it was just trying to get, get out of their way. I remember one pitch, um, like uh, the network wanted JG to do an episode that had like a real story and a real emotional heart to it, and he did this board and like he did the pilot, which was a, which was the one about you know Mordecai and Rigby playing rock paper scissors for the the chair. And it was great. And then when he did the second board, it was like okay, now we need a real story. And so he did this one, I think, where Skips was upset that he was losing an arm wrestling thing, and it just, it, it felt very writery, and it felt like, it didn't feel like the pilot, and it, it just wasn't great. And there was a middle gag of Mordecai and Rigby trying to get a raise by playing this song and doing a synchronized dance. And I remember we, he pitched the board, and, and Sorcher was kind of silent, and, and, and he was like, what happened? I'm like, wait. We happened, we gave him too many notes. We, we, there were too many people bogging him down. And I said, JG, my favorite part of this board is Mordecai and Rigby trying to get a raise. That's your favorite part, isn't it? And he's like, yeah, that's my favorite part. And I'm like, that should have been the episode. That's it. Right. They're trying to do the synchronized dance and that's the show. Like, it's not complicated. So that's sort of the way we helped is just like, from experience, but this, 
you do what you do best. Just do do your thing. Was it gratifying for you, sort of being this like kind of elder stage? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. It was a little <laughs> bit like just sitting in the room going, we, you know, you overnoted him. Right. And he has it right here. And then when he reboarded it, everyone loved it. So you knew Adventure Time was going to be the biggest hit. Yes. I saw it when it went onto YouTube, and I just, you know, I think Penn's name, Fred Seibert, uploaded it. And I just wrote to Penn going, my name's Craig McCracken. I think your thing is the greatest short I've seen in a long time. I don't know who you are, but this is great. And then I think I met him at the Bigfoot Lounge, like, two or three days later. And, like, I'm like... Your pen? Like, like it wasn't what I was picturing. I went to middle school with Penn. Really? Yes, yeah, so and he would draw the literally the same characters on yeah. my, you know, math homework. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember when we, we took him out to lunch to say, like, hey, do you want to be part of the Cartoon Institute? And he's like, yeah, that sounds interesting. I also might want to go to Oregon and photocopy, like, indie comics. And I'm like, <laughs> we are maybe yeah. offering you your own television show. <laughs> and it was just like... That's he's purely that's who he is. Yes. Yeah. The best. Oh yeah. The best. Um, do you still find yourself giving notes on people's? Product? I mean, besides Lauren, obviously. I mean, are you and Gendy still swapping? You know, scripts and Gendy things. And I, yeah, Gendy and I haven't really worked with each other in a long time. Yeah. You know, we're sort of we've got our own things that we're doing. Yeah. So, yeah. No, well, I would give much. you stuff. You know, if I, I would want. You know, you are. You, you had it. You, as we look around the walls, right. you had a pretty good career. Well, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know. But you don't you don't sort of offer advice or anything? Not unsolicited. Okay. Like people are... All right. Okay. So let's talk about one of my favorite projects of mm. yours, Wander Over Yonder. Oh, yeah! Ah, thanks. Yeah, it's a Wander Over on your shirt. Is that was that is that official merch or no, did you make that? Not official merch. No, okay. <laughs> All right, it's already getting Heated. Okay, uh, so where, cause some, there is some art on the wall of sort of a comic book yeah. version. So where did it come from and what were your initial sort of thoughts? Wander about? just started as me drawing in my sketchbook when I would come home from work on Foster's. Okay. Like, I didn't want to have to draw for animation. I just wanted to, like, try out pen nibs and ink. And, and I just started drawing this, like, hippie Muppet wandering around in nature. Right? Yeah. I just started drawing him. And then I started to develop more characters, and then my agent called me once and said, Jack McBrayer loves Fosters, and he wants to take you guys to lunch. And I went, oh, wow, I'm not one of those guys. I don't make, I'm not like a celebrity guy. And he's like, just go to lunch with him, you know. And so Warren and I went to lunch with Jack, and he is literally the nicest guy you'd ever meet. He is who he is on camera. And he's like, I just love Fosters. I think it's so great and so sweet. And if you ever have a role for me, a small one, I'll do anything. And I, we, I, Lauren and I left for lunch, and I said, I think I just met this guy I've been drawing in my sketchbook. I think I just <laughs> met Wander. And so then I started thinking about him more as a character and how what world he could inhabit and live in. And I, I did more art, and I went to lunch with Jack again. I said, do you want to be this guy? And he went, yes, absolutely. My God, I can't believe you're writing a whole character for me. So, and that, so that's kind of how it started. And I was doing a graphic novel with Wander. And Sylvia was in it, Hader was in it. I had kind of gotten 60 pages in it and it was right after I left Cartoon Network and Eric Coleman wanted to have lunch with me. So I just brought it with me and let him look through it and he said, I want to develop this into a series. So that's where that kind of, so then I stopped working on the graphic novel and got hired by Disney to start developing the show. Did you leave Cartoon Network for any reason? Uh, yeah, they had Andrew WK screaming, we're not just cartoons, uh, <laughs> on air. And it was just like, wait a minute. And like, I understood what they were doing, but it was just like, it, it just really felt like they were in, for that window of time, they were embarrassed that they were a cartoon network. And I, the thing is, I had had a contract that renewed every three years. Right, and so, and normally, once it got time to renewal, they would do negotiations with my reps, and it was literally the Friday before the Monday before my contract expired, and they hadn't you talked heard to me. Anything. I hadn't heard anything. And I went in, I'm like, what's going on? You want me here or not? And it was, you know, it was a weird meeting, and then I packed up all my stuff and emptied out the PowerPuff display case and went, left. Wow. And never went back. Wow. <laughs> it was just like, okay, you, you, you wanted something else. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah. So they said, don't let the door hit you. Where the good sort of, I, yeah, I don't know. I think they were, they, you know, they wanted live action. They wanted, and you know, even when they were developing Adventure Time and regular show, I don't think they knew what those things would become. Yeah. You know. Um, so what was it like working with Disney on Wonder Over Yonder? Because it seems like you always kind of find yourself in a really exciting kind yeah. of a creative atmosphere at the right time. Right. And during this time at Disney, some people, you know, they were, they were greenlighting things like Future Worm and yeah. Alex was working on Gravity Falls. Right. And so like, yeah, what was, what was that environment well, like? Well, what it was like is, you know, Disney had had success with Dan and Swampy with Phineas and Ferb, right? They had like, they had trusted artists and done their first yeah. creator driven thing and it worked. So they brought in Eric Coleman and Eric's like, I'll get more people. And so Hirsch came in and did Gravity and was incredible. And then I kind of came, and then I think um, Noah Jones came in, did Fish Hooks. Yep. And then they brought me in and we started developing Wander. And as I was developing Wander, I was like, are you sure this fits on Disney Channel? <laughs> like, it, like I, I, I'm happy that we're developing it, but I don't see it fitting with your beautiful teenagers. I, I just don't, I don't see how it fits there. We have a room full of them right now. But, but, and, and, and Eric said, I assure, and I'm like, it doesn't feel like the Disney brand. And he said, I assure you, don't worry about the brand. Don't worry about the Disney brand. So then we, we made the show and it was on Disney Channel for, I think, three or four weeks. And then they were like, put all cartoons on Disney XD. Right. You know, and so they just kind of, even grab it. And like they moved all of us to yeah. Disney XD, and it was like, okay, I may have been right, but like <laughs> these things were too weird for the Disney brand. And I think they were figuring out like what is a Disney creator-driven cartoon. Yeah. And one, you know, one thing that Wander didn't have, which a lot of their shows have, it didn't have any kids in it. it didn't have any humans in it. It yeah. wasn't grounded on Earth. And I think they were looking for something more like that. I think it was just too weird. You know, I made a cult hit at the biggest, like, mainstream animation <laughs> studio on the planet. Well, what was the, what were the, some of the chief inspirations? Obviously it has this kind of, like, psychedelic 70s album cover kind right. of aesthetic, but what were you looking at? Muppets. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> Muppets. Always Muppets. Always, always Muppets. <laughs> um, there was a show, um, you know, Yellow Submarine for sure, there was this show uh, called uh, Professor Balthazar. Um, this, if, I think it's from Croatia, I want to say, and it was made in the late 60s. So you were really using touch points at every... Yeah, of course, course. every yeah. kid knows yeah. Professor Balthazar, but it's yeah. just beautiful and psychedelic and kind of UPA-ish. And, I, you know, we just, like, I always saw Wander Over Yonder as, like, Bugs Bunny cartoons about the spirit of love and hate chasing each other through the universe, right? And that's what it was. And that's kind of artsy and abstract and didn't really fit in with Disney, but, you know, that's essentially what it was. Well, you got to do some really exciting things we did. with it. Yeah. It's such a beautiful show. Thank it's you. so powerful and elemental, and yeah. it's and it's got some great sort of action set pieces. It does, too. yeah. Yeah. Is that you were looking to sort of work those muscles? I think so. I, in, in high, well, here's what was interesting. When I was first developing Wander at Disney, I realized, oh, this is haters' show, <laughs> right? Because Wander, he doesn't want anything. He's like, he's like comedy Buddha. He's like perfectly enlightened. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't want anything. It's really hard to write a character or a protagonist that doesn't have needs or wants. Hater is a mess, right? So I originally, when I started developing Wander, it started becoming like, more about hater show. So the original pilot started with hater, about this guy who wanted to be the best and the greatest in the galaxy, and he wanted to prove he was this amazing villain, and he hated that his nemesis was this goofball. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but I think when I pitched it, the executives were like, well, why doesn't it start with Wander? It, the show's called Wander Over Yonder, and it should start with Wander. And I'm like, I should have said, can I call it Lord Hater Greatest in the Galaxy? Because I felt we could have made the exact same show but it may have connected with audiences quicker if it was like, oh, it's about this bad guy, and it's funny that that's his nemesis. Right. You know, but Disney was like, I, I, I'm like, I, we probably couldn't put Lord Hater the Greatest in the Galaxy on Disney Channel. <laughs> so it, it didn't happen that way, but you know, we did get to make a lot of incredible cartoons, extremely cartoony cart shows, yeah. and we're really proud of it. And he's really such a great it. foil, though, because he, he, he kind of like, Goofs his way through all these Rube Goldberg oh, yeah, type yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was like the cartooniest cartoon I had ever made. 
Well, what, <laughs> I imagine going into a Disney production, mm -hmm. you have a certain set of expectations. Yeah. There will be toys at the Disney store. There will be a McDonald's Happy Meal for sure. everybody to grab. None of this happened. No wonder every under. In fact, there was a complete sort of gulf of, of product or any kind of ancillary merchandise. Yeah. And how did that make you feel? Well, I realized because you know I spent all my time at Cartoon Network, and Cartoon Network was like a mom and pop shop, right? Yeah. So it was like I knew the people who did the on-air promotion. I knew the people who did consumer products. I'd go to lunch with them. I could call them. Disney is like this giant machine, yeah. and like. The consumer products division is like a separate company than the television animation company. They're like so big, and I didn't. And it, like it was, I never even spoke to the consumer products people. Um, I think uh, one executive met with them once about Wander, and they said, "Oh, you're still doing that?" Like, so I just realized, and I had heard like, "Oh, well, they're, they're not going to come to the table unless there's a guaranteed billion dollars of profit on the table." And I'm like, oh, "What? I don't know how to." I mean, they. They didn't do much with gravity either. No, that was like yeah. one of the greatest shows that have been made in a long time. Yeah. It's like so I just think it was I'm really proud of the show and they were really supportive. You know, the TVA people were really supportive and we worked really hard on it. But I just think that it's it's a giant, you know, machine is Disney and it's just hard to kind of get in there and do something a little weird. Well when did you know it was gonna not be picked up, and do you want to tell us how you would have ended the show? Or uh, is there ever a chance? A little back? bit. I mean, we had a third season. We didn't have the whole thing planned. I don't want everyone to think we'd written every episode. We had like a proposal. Yeah. Here's what we would do for season three. Um, and we went in and we pitched it, and we had just won the Annie for outstanding series. So I thought, oh, maybe that'll convince them to do it. Um, but you know, we pitched it to them, and they ultimately said, no, we're not going to do the third season. You know, and it was just like, oh, okay, uh, sucks. We were really excited about it. Well, we, one thing we were going to do with third season, and one thing that was hard about Wander Over Yonder, is travel shows are production killers because you have no reuse. Yeah. You have no reuse characters, you have no reuse environments. It's, it's just it's a nightmare to, to produce those shows. So we're like, how do we do Wander and at least get them in the same environment? Right? So we had this idea where, you know, the end of season two, they were all stuck on the Lonely Planet, they had defeated Dominator, and then one was like, well, let's get everybody home. And that planet, there was a crashed ship, and so they, you know, pulled an electric mayhem, and they painted it up all psychedelic <laughs> or whatever, and they were powering it by orbitals, and so all of Wander's friends from the, all the different planets were on the ship, and they're like, hey, your beepers, watchdogs, come on, join our ship. Right, and so it was gonna be, you know, life on the Star Nomad as they were trying to take people back to their planets, but that wasn't really happening. They were just having fun, but Hader had to like, you know, share a room with Wander, you know? And it was like, because we realized in certain episodes when we put the four of them together, they were like magic. You know, whenever we got Wander, Hader, and Sylvia and Peepers together, it was just, so we were like, how do we do more of that? So that was going to kind of be the main thrust of the show. There were other things in Hader's origin and stuff that we were going to explore. Is there ever a chance of it coming back? Or are you doing a comic book? I'm not, I'm not. Well, I don't know if I legally can. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the problem with it coming back is all the champions of Wander aren't there anymore. Yeah. Like, the, Disney's gone through a lot of turnover with executives, and it's just, I don't, I don't even know if they know they own it. You know, it's like, uh, maybe they do, but it's, it, I just don't think it's something that's on their radar right. there. Now that they, we also learned, I remember when we were there, because we were making Wander, and I remember when they bought Star Wars and they bought Marvel, we were like, oh no, They're, this is going to be hard for new seeds to be planted and watered and nurtured and grown, because they just bought these giant forests yeah. that had been grown by other places for generations, right? Yeah. So that's when we knew, like, this is going to be a hard sell to sell to get this sold through. And it's, that's buried out. I mean, I think right. that um, Amphibia and Owl House are kind of the yeah. end of a, an era. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about Kid Cosmic. <laughs> yes! Yes! What a show! Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, 
So where did kid content come from? And was the three season structure sort of always something that you had in mind? Well, sort of. Kid Cosmic was the thing, because like I said, I realized the secret formula to Disney shows was put a kid in it. Yeah. If you put a kid in it and put humans in it, it's going to connect to the executives. They're going to understand it. So I had had this comic strip, I don't know if there's any up, called The Road to Nowhere about this weird kid who lived in this desert community and kind of just drove the local people to talk, talk stop crazy. And he found a piece of scrap metal in the desert and he swore it was part of a spaceship and he was destined to save the universe. So, and that was like from 2009. And I loved this idea and I went, oh, I can't make this a show that's random 11 minutes, right? It needed to be serialized. So I'm like, no one was making serialization. So I stuck it in a drawer. And then Hirsch makes Gravity Falls and proves that serialization can work. Yep. And I'm like, aha, there's a chance. So I went to Frank Angone's and I was talking to Lauren about it. And I'm like, look at this comic strip. What do you think? Can we do this? So we actually developed Kid Cosmic, which was originally called The Kid from Planet Earth, at Disney after Wander. Oh. So it was a show, and I, we probably developed it for a year and a half at Disney, and Disney loved it, right? It was, we did the whole pilot, we had created all the characters, they were really excited about it, and you know, they were looking for a boys comedy action show for Disney SD. And they were, they loved it, and we're like, oh, okay, we're gonna get, I was even having meetings with who my point person would be when the show got picked up at Disney. And then they had, uh, when it came time to pick shows up, they only had a budget to pick up one show. And they decided that they were no longer gonna program for Disney XD. And they wanted girl-driven shows for Channel. Disney Channel. Okay. And so, Owl House, you know, Dana got Owl House picked up. And it was great. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. Dana did an amazing job with that. And she's incredibly talented, she deserved that. But they were like, yeah, we don't, we love Kid from Planet Earth, but we're not making boys comedy action shows anymore. And I was like, oh, okay, uh, all right. But my agent had worked it out that in my contract, if they passed on it, I got it back. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, not, now, now, like, I, I didn't, I got, I, you know, whoever was going to pick it up was going to have to pay for what Disney put into it. But I had legally had the right to go pitch it. So I had this pilot, 22 minute pilot animatic for uh, Kid from Planet Earth. I took it to Netflix. I played it for Netflix. They watched it and they were like, this is great. Can you send us a digital copy? I then sent them a digital copy. They shared it with some of the other executives. They called me in a few days later. They gave me the tour of what the Netflix studios was gonna be. And then I was like, wow, this is great. You're gonna do this like creator-driven studio and give artists a chance to do whatever they want. And then I sat down with the executive. I said, okay, what do I need to do to sell this here? And they're like, it's sold. We're doing it. <laughs> and they're like, how does three seasons of 10 episodes sound? I'm like, perfect. <laughs> like, and so it was, it was a really incredible time for them to just go, we want you to just do what you do and just, you know, focus so there was on no quality. development at Netflix? Not at Netflix, no. We just started making it. You know, there was a little bit of like, you know, they told me, okay, you're going to have 30 episodes, which eventually turned into 24, but it, it was going to be 10 episodes a season, 22 minute episodes. So I sat down and went, okay, here's what I want. Here's the season one arc. Here's what I want to do for season two. Here's what I want to do for season three. And kind of presented it to them just so they were aware. Right. Um, but there wasn't any real notes or change this to this or any of that. What the only note I got was, we have a show called The Last Kids on Earth, and so the kid from Planet Earth may be problematic. Can you come up with another title? Okay. That was it. What happened to the extra four episodes, six episodes? Uh, we were behind schedule. <laughs> and, uh, and well, the other hand slapped. Uh, no, no, not at all. We actually realized we were we were breaking stories, and we were like, this story that we've broken, it's only going to take eleven minutes. We don't need 22 minutes. So we started like just going, oh, if you take episode seven from season three and put it with episode eight, and we just started minimizing the episode order. And we went to them and said, can we make 24 instead? Because what we didn't want to do is we didn't want to stall. Right. We didn't want to go like, the story's not progressing or moving forward, but we need to fill airtime because they picked up 30, right? So we just asked them, can we do less? And they were like, yeah, if it's a better way to tell the story, that's fine. 
And what was the like working with all those guys? Because Frank was on it, Rob was on it too, right? Rob was my Alex number two. Stuff. Alex came in for some story meetings for the end of season one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah what was it like, sort of? Great. He's brilliant. Yeah. You know, and it's it, you know, yeah, we were just having really great story meetings, and and uh, it was just it was it was like making a Rolls Royce. You know, it was like handcrafting every episode carefully. There wasn't this panic of production. Like everything could be thoughtful, and, and the fact that it was it's it's a seven hour and twenty minute story. Yeah. Right. And the fact that it all could be woven together and just it, we really loved producing that. And you worked with Mercury on mm -hmm. that, right? Which yeah. they worked on Wander. Yeah, they did Wander season one for us. Uh, and they are just like the best. Oh, but, yes. but you really pushed sort of graphically, you know, the look of everything. And right. Did they love that? Was it? Yeah. Well, what we, we what we uh, sort of what I thought about Kid Cosmic is Kid Cosmic is sort of like a punk rock superhero team, right? Meaning that they don't really have talent, but they have the passion, right? Right. <laughs> so we wanted to kind of have a design style that looked human, right? And because everything gets so slick and perfected these days, so you remove the humanity. So that's why in Siriotis' backgrounds, you can see pencil sketches, yeah. right? You can see paint, that the character's lines don't close. That we wanted, even though it was done digitally, we wanted it to have that human quality because I always said, you know, Kid Cosmic was about the people, not the powers. It was a real human story. And so we wanted the visuals to sort of reflect that. Well, and you created such a emotional sort of yeah. achievement. Was, yeah. was that something that you were sort of challenging yourself to do? Yeah. Okay. Look, I never, well, I'm watching what Alex is getting to do with Gravity Falls and telling these really sincere stories. And I'm like, oh, I, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. Like, yeah. I had that in me and I just wish I could do that. And even when we did Wander season two, they were like, you can do a little bit of serialization. Yeah. Not all of it. Yeah. So we had like four stories that sort of arced, but we couldn't fully do it. Right. So I'd just been itching to do that. And having characters that go, that are, you know, that eight, grow eight, and change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But are also from 8 to 80. Is, yeah. It was, you know, mm -hmm. you get this like whole sense of lives that are being. Yeah, we yeah. like the idea of putting together a superhero team of just who happened to be around, yeah. right? So there's a four year old girl and there's his old grandpa and the teenage waitress and this cat. You know, it's like, it's just who we had. It's like you would never make that the real superhero team if you were trying. And we always said, you know, what we liked about Kid Cosmic is it was about the fantasy of being a hero versus the reality of being a hero, right? And a lot of kid heroes and kid shows are always aspirational, like, you want to be him. And I'm like, I want to do a show about the kid you are. Like, you are him. Yeah. You know, and it's hard. And like a lot of my favorite moments in superhero movies are the training montages where they suck. Yeah. And I'm like, let's make a whole show about sucking. Well, he's, 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 he's a real shit in season three. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah. You didn't shy away from it. No, no. He's got, he's, you know, he gets frustrated because he's a real kid. Yeah. You know, a lot of times kids are prayed, like I said, aspirational. They behave perfectly, they answer everything perfectly. I'm like, that's not how kids are. You know? Well, the interesting thing about Kid Cosmic too is you went into it what you know the 1994 NBA All Star team was being mm -hmm. assembled at Netflix. You yeah. left when it was absolutely falling apart. And, yeah, and I wanted to know what it was like being there for that time, and were you sort of understanding like we've got to get this out before? Well, it didn't start falling apart until after we were wrapping it up. Okay, right. I remember there was one meeting, and there was a whole shift of executives who had changed through and the new executives came in they said so where are you guys on kid what do you need you need any help and i'm like nope we're done we had shipped the last episode to mercury we're done and so like <laughs> boy if we had made that 30 we would have been who knows what they would have done or they may not have let us finish yeah right and so we're like we just really lucked out that we got that finished when we did did you have any sort of survivor's guilt <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember telling Phil Rinda, I said, man, I thought I was going to retire here. Yeah. Like, I had this other show I wanted to make for years, and, it, and I thought, like, you guys would let me make it. And it didn't happen. You know, and Lauren sold a show there and was getting to do her dream project and finally do her own idea. And they just, like, cut it short. Like, she didn't get a chance to tell that story. And it was incredible. And it was amazing. It was great. And they were, like, they were going to ship their... At first episode of Mercury to animate on a Monday, and they called her on a Friday, and she had to.
cancel the whole show and fire the entire crew. Oh, it was bad, and like we were all saying, like this doesn't happen. They don't cancel shows in production. They might not pick it up for more, but they don't just yeah. cancel. You want to tell us what that other show was? Are you still uh, working on it? Um, it's just, I, no, I don't want to pitch it because it's just this idea I've had for years, and it's just like somebody. I actually had it in at Sony. Uh, in development as a live action animation hybrid in 2010. Oh wow! Right, and we had done character designs for it, and we had done we had broken the story for it, and um, they were ready to have us start doing some board, you know, testing out boards. And then the woman who was championing it, who was, uh, really loved the project, she got promoted to a higher position at Sony, and so then our kind of champion was gone. And the new people kind of didn't want to inherit or whatever, and so it just sort of disappeared. It just never, be, but that's what this industry is like. It's like you, you really are beholden to who the executives are at the time you're working there. You know, and I look back on my career and I'm like, man, Kenny and I were lucky that we worked under Mike and Linda. Yeah. You know, like you just to have that trust. So you're always sort of kind of up against that. So were you in Lorna? Sony at the same time? Was that when she was doing Medusa? No, this was after. Okay. Yeah. Wow. No, no well, Medusa was after when I was that there. Okay. Yeah. And this was right before. Did not see the rest of life day. Although I saw some pencil tests on Twitter or something the other day. And yeah, I was like, this, this is going to be awesome. Yeah, well, that, that was post Lauren. Lauren's version was CG and it was great and they had an incredible script and incredible designs and it was going to be great. And I think somebody just thought, like, can we sell a movie about a girl? And it just didn't move forward. Uh, do you want to do another feature? I would, yeah. With yeah. all of your knowledge now. I would, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's made a seven hour and 20 minute feature. With you did, Cosby, you but did. like, yeah. And, you know, I'm sort of talking with Warner Brothers right now. I'm doing a new version of Powerpuff and a new, like, the Foster Youth yeah. Principal spinoff. But Sam Register came to me early last year and said, what if you could do Powerpuff and you didn't have to wrap up the episode every 11 or 22 minutes? What if you could tell a bigger story with these characters in okay. this world? And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. That's yeah. neat. So I kind of, my tagline for this new project is, you know, bigger crimes, tougher fights, higher stakes. Right? <laughs> so I'm like, oh. And so this idea that I have, I'm like, it could be a movie. It could be a serialized show. Right. But I don't know what it's ultimately going to become. But we also need the original Craig McCracken stories. So yes. I hope that you are still yes. over. Okay. Well, I, in my time, the four months okay. I was at Netflix post Kid Cosmic, I came up with 16 pitches for ideas. And um, now they weren't fully formed ideas. They were just like, hey, here's some, some, here's some art and an elevator pitch. What do you think it is? Yeah. Here's another one. What do you think it is? So I've got a bunch of other ideas that I kind of just got in a drawer that could be something someday. You know? I hope that that. I hope it does too, yeah, I really do. On the other end of the spectrum, is there a property that you would love to put, put in? Uh, boy, there was a very short period of time where Sam Register called me into Warner Brothers years ago after, I can't remember, it was about Wander, and he's like, I want to do an animated Buckaroo Banzai for Adult Swim. Whoa. And I was like, I have a pitch, <laughs> right? And so, you know, if anyone's seen it, it's a crazy cult hit film. It's one of my favorite things. But I had this, and in the world of Buckaroo Banzai, there's comic books, there's video games, there's, he's a celebrity, he's got albums out. I'm like, well, logically, there would have been an animated series produced by Filmation and or Deke in the 1980s, <laughs> yeah. right? And so I wanted to do a version of Buckaroo Banzai where there was a, an animated version of Buckaroo made in 1984 um, and it was being animated overseas, and when the plane was flying back with the footage, Buckaroo's nemesis, Hanoi Jan, shot down the plane, the footage had been lost in the snow forever, and then through Warner Brothers Animation and Craig McCracken, we have found the footage and restored it. So it was a way to make a straight up 1984 animated Buckaroo Bonsai with the original cast and shoulder pads and 80s clothes and like not try to reimagine it, just make it. So what was, I pitched it to Sam and he was like, I love that, but the weirder thing is that's almost exactly what the creator and director of Buckaroo Bonsai pitched me. 
Wow. And I'm like, well, then we're on the same page. Yeah. You know? Now, theirs wasn't as detailed or as elaborate, but it was like the fact that, like, even I didn't get to make it, the fact that I had thought the same thing and we were connected to the same wavelength was enough for me. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Oh, thank this you. It's been amazing. Thanks.